Hey guys, I'm continuing on with the Zenith Bug Eye that I got working in the last video. That was the Model Z 1510L. If you recall, I had finished recapping it, then had to do a little bit of troubleshooting, and now I've got a nice, clean, bright, stable picture. Next, I went and checked all the tubes, and I just found one tube that was a little weak in the IF and replaced that, and one tube in the tuner that had some secondary emission, also known as leakage, and I replaced that. Now what I want to do is check on the power supply and the filament with the set running at 125 volts AC. So I've adjusted my variac, so I've got 125 volts AC right at the AC input with the set turned on. I noticed that when I adjusted for 125 volts AC with the set turned off, and then turned it on, the voltage dropped down to about 120. I imagine my variac uh, has some losses within it, so when there's a lot of current being drawn, you lose some uh, voltage in the variac itself, so I had to tweak it up a bit, so now I'm at 125. And with that going, I measured B plus on the set, which should be 245, and I've got 256, which actually is not as high as I thought it would be. Because if you recall, I took out the seleniums and have modern silicon diodes down in there, which have less loss. And I also took out the fusible resistor, which was dropping some voltage. So right now, there's, there's nothing to drop the voltage down whatsoever, but we're only about 10 volts high. So I could probably just leave it like that. But uh, I want to tinker a bit and see if I can drop that down a little, a little more just to get it closer to the original specs. And now what I'm doing is I'm checking the, the current through the tubes. There's a 17 ohm dropping resistor in this set to make up for the fact that the tube filaments don't add up to 120 uh, or 117 volts AC. For a refresher, here's a look at the schematic. So here's all the tube filaments wired in series, and see there's a 17 ohm 7 watt resistor they threw in there, because the tube filaments don't quite add up to 117 if you add them all together. But even if they did, we've got 125 now, not 117. At least in my outlets, I have 125. So I have hooked up my AC voltmeter across that resistor, and I'm getting. 8.26 volts, or 8.27 volts AC, and I've measured the resistor, and it is pretty close to 17 ohms, so if I do a little ohms law, I can figure out what the current actually is through this set. So if I divide that voltage, 8.27, divide by 17 ohms, we've got, oh, let's call it 0.49 amps. So it's a little high. So I think I should bump that resistor up to more like 22 ohms. And uh, to get that current down a little bit. Having more current run through the tubes is going to shorten their life. And I don't want to do that, especially on the pitcher tube. So let's increase that resistor and see if we get that current down a little bit lower. And while I'm at it, I'll throw in a resistor into the B-plus circuit. Now, I don't have any convenient way to see how much current the B-plus is drawing, so I'm just going to guesstimate, and I think I'll uh, let's throw a 10-ohm resistor in there and see what that does for us. Here's my new filament dropping resistor. Notice one with 33 ohms at 10 watts. Now, if you're wondering how I got that... Well, the original design called for 17 ohms, and there's 0.45 amps running through it. You use Ohm's law, it's dropping approximately 7.5 volts. Now, I'm adjusting the set, which was designed to run on 117 volts, to run on 125. In other words, 8 more volts coming into the set, which I want to have this new resistor get rid of. So we take 7.5 volts, add 8 volts to it. And again, with Ohm's Law, divide it by 0.45 amps, we get rounding off about 33 ohms. So that's what I went with. As far as the current rating, wattage is I squared times R. 0.45 squared times 
33 is, I think around six and a half watts. Let me recalculate that quickly. 33, about 6.7. Uh, I like to try to get about double the wattage if possible. So I didn't quite get there, but I think that's enough overhead. I'm not too concerned about this resistor burning up. And I mounted it so it's away from anything else because this will get toasty. And now let's make sure this set still works. Got my voltmeter across that resistor again. And I was shooting for dropping 15.5 volts across it. And hey, how about that? Just about 15.5, which means we've got 0.45 amps running through the tubes now. And this set still works. If I hook up an antenna, just stick my finger on the antenna terminal. There we go. All right, now let's tackle the B plus issue. I almost forgot before I uh, talked about experimenting with using different capacitor values on the voltage doubler. So let's revisit that right now. First thing I'm gonna do is, is the quickest and easiest thing to do. This capacitor, right now I've got 120 microfarad in there. I'm gonna drop it all the way down to 68 microfarad just because I happen to have one handy. And I want to see what effect that has on this voltage here. Not only how much it drops down, but how much ripple there is. There's supposed to be 0.5 volts peak to peak at 30 hertz, or less. So, by putting a smaller cap there, I assume I'm going to be robbing the set of some current, which will drop this voltage down, but it will probably also introduce a bit of ripple. So I'm curious to see what effect that's going to have. Here's the simplified power supply diagram that I showed way back in part one. So we've increased this resistor and taken care of this issue, so we have the correct current flow through here. Now let's see if we can get 245 over here. So remember, seleniums are gone, silicon's in their place with no added dropping resistor. I've also taken out the fusible resistor and just put a plain old fuse in there. And I have now dropped this down to 68 microfarads. That cap down there. Got my voltmeter at this point. I turn it set on and let's see what we've got now. The voltage is shot up. This set warms up, it should drop down. Well, that's pretty darn close to 245, and I didn't have to add any dropping resistors. Set so seems to be playing well. Okay. But what about that ripple? So I can just throw this over into AC mode. And I'm going to switch to a scope because I don't know how accurate this is when measuring ripple. It's going to jump on all over the place. I've hooked my scope up to this point, and volts peak to peak, about a thousand millivolts or one volt. So that's double what the schematic calls for. So that's not so great. I could increase this capacitor value, or go back and increase this one. In hindsight, I'm <laughs> kind of annoyed that when I had the bigger cap in there, I didn't measure this peak to peak voltage. So I'm going to go back and do that first off and make sure that having a larger cap in here does actually drop down the ripple over here before I start messing around with adding a resistor in there. I switch back to the bigger cap and guess what? Still one volt peak to peak of ripple. So I think that smaller cap will work just fine and it does drop the voltage down. So I'm going to put it back in there. Now I'm not recommending that everybody do this to every set every time there's a replacing selenium rectifiers with a voltage doubler to go ahead and drop this cap down. But uh, having an engineering background I was curious to give this a try. The reason I don't recommend you do it in every set is that you're going to confuse some poor future restorer who looks at this set and wonders why it doesn't match the original schematic and why did the guy do this and so on. 
unless maybe you put a detailed note in there <laughs> explaining why you did this. But uh, it is uh, it does seem to be an option. Something to think about. Because adding a resistor in here, resistor in here, leaving this resistor in here, it kicks out a fair amount of heat. Alright, now that this set's working, there's just one last thing to do, which is an alignment. But, before I jump into that, my friend arrived this afternoon with a couple pitcher tubes. So I want to jump back to that first chassis I was working on and pop the proper pitcher tube into it. Because when I do the alignments, I want to do all the sets at once, rather than have to keep jumping back and forth between recapping and aligning and so on. Because to do the alignment, I'm going to have to clear off my workbench and set up some equipment. Here are the two pitcher tubes he dropped off. One of them is a Rolland 14XP4A, just like the one in the set that was just on the workbench. That's the aluminized version. I think in an earlier video I mistakenly speculated that Rolland was a CRT rebuilder. Somebody posted a comment correcting me. They were a, uh, a, I guess, a contract CRT manufacturer working under Zenith. So these were the original pitcher tubes used in the Zenith sets. This one, however, is a rebuild. See, it's Continental Electronics Corp. Very noticeable. It's got a weld here on the neck where this was cut open, new gun installed, and it was re-welded, but uh, this is what I find especially curious. 14R slash XP4. You may recall the Motorola portable that I worked on a while ago had a 14RP4 in it. 14RP4 runs on 600 milliamps. 14XP4 runs on 450 milliamps. I find it a little hard to believe that they could have come up with an electron gun that could run under either current and work just fine in the set and not throw off the other tubes. So I'm thinking what's more likely is that they printed out one label that they would use on either one of those CRT rebuilds. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if they had like circled the R or the X, it would make more sense to me. I, I, I don't know. I guess I could check uh, the DC resistance on the two filaments and see how they compare. And then I'll fire up the CRT tester and see how they check out. I'll test them both. It's a type 14 XP4 because that's what the sets call for and that's where they came from. Well, I just checked the DC resistance. This is 2.1 ohms. This was around 1.4. So they do not have the same DC resistance, so this may very well be a 600 milliamp CRT filament. Uh, just like that test CRT I was using, that 8XP4, that little guy. And if you recall, that was able to produce an image, so I'm thinking that may, this may very well be a, some type of universal replacement, but I'm guessing it works a lot better in a set that runs at a higher current rather than a lower current. We'll find out when we pop it in the set and see uh, what kind of an image it produces. I'm testing the rebuilt CRT first, and I hooked up an ammeter in series with the filament. And oh yeah, it's drawn 0.6 amps, not 0.45. I'm not sure how this will work in the set, but uh, it is what it is. I don't have any other spare, so we're going to have to go with this one. Uh, the emission's good, for what it's worth. Uh, but, no cutoff control, but I'm setting it, I got it set up as a 14XP4. Let's see what a 14RP4 should have for the bias range. 36, eh? that's what I've got it on. So, no cutoff control when you're in the cutoff mode, but when I go to emissions and twiddle the cutoff control, it does respond, so... I imagine it'll work to some extent. After all, this was in a TV that I assume was functioning at some point. So, well, one way to find out for sure, and that's to try using it in the set. 
Okay, now for the second CRT, this one is drawing 0.45 amps, like it should be. As for the tests, the shorts, the shorts, cut off, works just like it's supposed to. And the emissions are pretty good, so. Alright, uh, we have three good picture tubes in a manner of speaking, just... Yeah, my doubts about this guy working right. It turns out that the first chassis I restored does use that questionable rebuilt pitcher tube, so we're going to find out real soon how that uh, works out. So I'm remounting it back into the faceplate. The way these pitcher tubes mount is pitcher tube is held on by a strap to the metal front of the set. The chassis then slides on around it and attaches on two screws on either side. Now that's directly glass on metal, so to protect it, they had these little bumper, rubber bumpers, pushed down onto posts around the outside perimeter. Well, these have all turned rock hard and shattered over time, so now I'm mushing on some new grommets. This size seems to work well, so I will go around and insert these, and then you tighten it down as one of these screws at either corner. Once that's done, carefully thread the yoke through the pitcher tube, and then these are the uh, brackets that attach to the faceplate. Alright, I got it back together as best I could using the one intact set as a model. Unfortunately, one thing I couldn't find was the bracket that secures the channel knob. It's a long shaft that goes all the way back to the tuner, and there's just nothing supporting it at the front side. Should be a little bracket that screws on behind. I, I couldn't find it in the box of parts that he gave me. Hopefully he's got that somewhere. Alright, so I guess there's nothing left to do but to try powering it up. Now the CRT does use an ion trap magnet, so I'm going to have to reach around behind there and fiddle with that. Try not to shock myself on anything. Also, I noticed that this CRT, or at least the CRTs and the inner two sets, are electrostatically focused. There's a little metal strap that shorts the focus pin to one of two other pins on the CRT base, and this stuff doesn't have that. So I don't know with the rebuilt CRT gun, maybe it doesn't need it, or maybe it fell off, I don't know. But assuming this does work, I wouldn't be surprised if the focus is off. Alright, here goes. Tubes are lighting up. Good sound. Right, just clip the antenna on. So we've got no image. First, let me double check so that we actually have voltage. Brightness is turned up, it's up all the way. So now to manipulate the ion trap. It's a magnet that clips on the neck of the CRT. You have to position it in a sweet spot to bend the electrons back so that they hit the face of the CRT instead of shooting at the side 
of the neck. Huh. That's not a good sign. I've gone all the way around 360 and I got nothing. So just sliding it back towards the base and go all the way around. Oh, there's something. I might also have this clipped on backwards. Boy, that's dim. <laughs> oh, there we go. Ooh, we still got some pretty bad deflection issues there, too. Let's see. Try to turn the contrast. Okay, there. I turned the contrast down. I'm going to get more of a range on the brightness. Still touchy, like with the other tests here, too. So, brightness control up here. If I go all the way to the end, we get that. If I back it off about 10%, it fades away almost to nothing. So let's get another control I'd like to replace if possible. Well, something else the set has is a little metal ring with a wire that is grounded to the chassis that's on the neck. And they call that a width sleeve in the uh, SAMS service info, but they give no indication of what it's for or how you're supposed to adjust it. But since it's called the width sleeve, I would assume that you manipulate it to change the width. There it is. So, width sleeve, and they just point to it, and that's the only mention of it I could find anywhere in the service info. I've never seen this in another set. I put it in about the same place as it was in the other set. So let me grab it here and Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. It's really not doing much of anything. Alright, so we might have some other issues. Vertical looks pretty much okay though. There's a height control. Yeah, so we have full, full vertical deflection, that's no problem. But obviously horizontals. It's crap. I'm adjusting the horizontal hold right now, so it's some serious horizontal width issues. Uh, that's ooh, only so much you can do to adjust that in this set apparently. So here is the deflection yoke. One section of windings, the ones they show horizontally here are actually the vertical windings. Those go to the transformer here, vertical output tube. The horizontal, which they have in vertical orientation, go down and it's tied to a tap on the flyback. So it seems like we have a pretty strong high voltage, so I would think there's a strong enough drive signal going through the flyback. Um, that I, I can do a resistance check on this. Oh, they do mention here to the metallic sleeve width adjust. This this little thing they indicate here is just a couple lines next to that coil. So the indicator resistance here should be about 38 ohms on the horizontal winding, so I can double check that. It's possible there's a shorted winding in the horizontal, which is causing a collapse like this. Also, uh, I could ask around about what that width sleeve is supposed to be doing. But one thing we can say is with this rebuilt pitcher tube that seems to spoke it seems to want to run on a six hundred milliamp current, not four fifty. It's producing an okay pitcher. I posed my questions online and right away got a bunch of great advice, including some pictures. Turns out this is the width sleeve. It's a piece of sheet brass that wraps it around the neck of the CRT and it would be partially inside the yoke and partially out. And this clip I was referring to, this metal ring here that's grounded, that goes around that sleeve to hold it in place and ground it. Now this sleeve is from a different set. The sleeve for this set, I think it's down in there. I think it's just slipped down inside the yoke 
so I'm going to have to take the set back apart, <laughs> unfortunately. So I can kind of see a glimmer of a brass color through the glass down inside there. So I think that that sleeve is entirely slipped down inside that yoke and there's no way I can get it out without taking the picture tube out again. It was a pain, but I had to do it. I pulled the CRT back out and hey, what do you know, there's the brass sleeve shoved all the way up inside the yoke. So I will push that. Well, actually, I'll just take it out entirely and I'll put this up back together and then it can be reinserted from the other end. All right, it's all back together once again. Got the brass sleeve extended out to about where I think it was before. You could, there was noticeably a cleaner suction of about half an inch. I figure that's how much of it must have been inside the yoke originally. And the next two inches or so are external. Got that grounded clip around it, which holds it together and in place. Stuck the ion trap magnet back on. I think about where I had it, but I'm sure I'll have to move it around a bit. And let's see if this will make any difference. I suspect it will, it's just a matter of how much. So what that does, if you're wondering, is having that brass sliding in and out inside that coil affects the inductance of it to some extent, which is what's altering the width. And there we go. It's just that easy. Let's get that height down. You know what? It's also affected the height. Because now the height, uh, before I was had to have it all the way at maximum to fill it up and it still wasn't quite full height and now it's extended over the full height so that inductance was also affecting the vertical windings a bit. These vertical controls are still kind of touchy. That's about right, I think. Find this control, still a bit screwy, but hey, we're getting there. And no doubt uh, that these issues with the brightness control and the vertical have, uh, are to some extent because of the, the crappy controls that are in there. But also I haven't gone through and checked the tubes and I also want to tweak this set especially with that filament current. I'm not quite sure what I want to do about that. I imagine the CRT will be happier with 600 milliamps going through it, but I don't want to put that much through the other tubes. In fact, I don't think it's even possible, even with the elevated line voltage, because they're just, uh, they're just not, they have too much internal resistance to let that much flow. And even if I did, that would be 33% over spec, and all the tubes would start burning out anyways. So, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I guess first thing I'll do is I'll... Do like the previous side, check the current flowing through the tubes and cut it down to 450 milliamps. And hey, if it works fine, great, we'll leave it at that. If not, well then uh, I'll explore some other possibilities. And here this side is playing some classic over-the-air programming. Now, if you were thinking that this bug-eye saga is almost at an end, oh no it's not. Because guess what I have? Oh yeah, we got one more to restore. So I figure I'll just tuck right into this and let's see what fun this one has in store for us. I'd like to think that I've been thrown just about every uh, problem these sets might have, but who knows? Who knows what we'll find with this one? This is actually going to upside down. It should be more like this. And this is yet another chassis variation. This one is a 16Z25. So I figure I'll start in on this chassis over the weekend or as soon as I can find the time. 
And once all three are running properly, I will do an alignment on them and clear them off the workbench and get back to the predictors.